Okay, so today I'll be talking about efficiently learning structured distributions from untrusted batches, and this is joint work with Jerry Lee and Nako Moitra. Broadly speaking, this work falls under the umbrella of the field of robust learning, the central goal of which is to design learning algorithms that can tolerate a constant fraction of corruptions in the data. Such corruptions arise in the context of adversarial examples for deep nets, data poisoning attacks on uh, recommendation systems, and malware classifiers. And more generally, the field of robust statistics has a long history of study dating back to seminal work of Tukey and Hubert even in the 60s. The particular problem that we'll be considering in this work uh, arises in settings where the learner might have access to data that was obtained in some crowdsourced fashion. Imagine you're some centralized server uh, that wants to train some kind of, uh, say, spell check over mobile devices. And our goal is to learn the underlying distribution over misspellings of a, part of a particular word. So here I'll denote that distribution, which is just some discrete distribution over some finite domain of size n uh, by p. And we as the server are going to obtain data from users' devices. So every user is going to send me a draw uh, from this underlying distribution p. And I'm going to aggregate this user data and attempt to learn p. So as I've described it, this is nothing more than classical distribution learning from IID data. Uh, but you can ask, what if some constant epsilon fraction of users actually are adversarial and give me uh, samples chosen in such a way to skew the outcome of my learner? Okay. So a basic but not particularly interesting barrier is that in this setting, as I've described it, uh, you can't distinguish between whether your data came from P or from any other epsilon perturbation of P in total variation distance. Okay. But you can imagine that in these crowdsource settings, you have a bit more information in the sense that every user is going to send you not a single draw from the distribution, but perhaps many draws. And the hope is that as the size of the batch of draws that every user provides you gets bigger and bigger, the added redundancy will allow you to drive this error smaller and smaller. And just to make the setting more realistic, you can imagine every user doesn't have exact sample access to P. Maybe user I only has, has sample access to some distribution P sub I, where P sub I is only promised to be somewhat close to the true distribution P. In that sense, we want to be able to tolerate these kinds of uh, deviations uh, from the true distribution from user to user. Okay. And uh, this kind of setting sometimes goes under, under the name federated learning. So this particular problem was introduced uh, by Chow and Valiant a couple of years back, uh, and they called it learning from untrusted batches. So now let me formalize what I described in the previous slide with some notation. So again, we have some discrete distribution P that we want to learn. And uh, we get access to P as follows. We have some collection of uh, capital N users, some uh, small but constant fraction epsilon of, of whom are malicious. Every non-malicious user is going to send me k iid draws from some distribution p sub i, which is delta at most delta far from p. Right? And each of these users will have some different p sub i. Okay. Um, on the other hand, every malicious user is going to just give me k uh, arbitrary, perhaps adversarially chosen elements from the underlying domain. And the point is that I don't know which users are malicious or not malicious. But my goal is still to be able to output some estimator p hat for the true distribution, which is close in total variation. So what's known about this problem? From the lower bound standpoint, uh, the original paper of Chan Valiant showed that even if you had an infinite number of samples, it's simply impossible to distinguish p to better than error 2 delta plus epsilon over root k. Where does the delta term come from? This just comes from the fact that for all we know, the user's distributions, p sub i, could have been identical delta perturbations of the true distribution. And there's no way to distinguish whether the true distribution were p or this delta perturbation of p. Where does the root k come from? This just comes from the rate at which TV tensorizes. So you can imagine even in the domain size two case, if I had a distribution which was Bernoulli one half minus some constant c, and I wanted to compare it to some uh, Bernoulli one half plus c, the point is that if I take KIID draws from both Bernoulli's to form binomial distributions, then the TV between the binomial distributions is going to become C times root K, roughly. Okay, so that's where the root K comes from. And 
Uh, right, so this is some basic impossibility result, and now the question is, can we actually attain this, uh, this lower bound with an algorithm? So in the same paper, Chow and Valiant show this in the affirmative, with an algorithm that runs in polynomial time in all parameters except the domain size. And the reason that they need to depend exponentially on the domain size is that they need to design some linear program uh, which has a variable for each subset of the domain. So in particular, um, the, the variable is going to correspond to the probability mass that the true distribution should assign to S, uh, to that subset. Um, and uh, the linear program requires forming all of these variables. Okay, on the other hand, in the case where delta equals zero, so in the case where all the users actually have exact access to the central distribution P, uh, they also give an algorithm which is polynomial in the domain size, but exponential in K, where K is the size of a given batch. Okay. Um, and the reason you need to run exponentially in K is that you need to brute force over slices of the kth empirical moment tensor with this algorithm. And so a basic uh, question you can ask is just, can I achieve this information theoretically optimal error up to constants in uh, time and samples polynomial in all parameters? Okay, um, so the first result of this work, which is sort of a warm up to the sort of techniques that we use uh, for our other results, is just for this uh, basic question, uh, we show that you can actually uh, approach this information theoretic uh, threshold of delta plus epsilon over root k efficiently. So formally, we show that for any even degree t, we can learn with an error uh, equal to this quantity in time which is polynomial in all parameters, uh, except uh, exponentially depending on t. But again, we can think of t as some constant, and so in particular, this runs in, all, uh, in polynomial in all relevant parameters. Okay. Uh, so some, uh, some interpretation for this quantity, if I take t to be roughly log 1 over epsilon, then this gives me error which is essentially uh, optimal up to this extra factor of root log 1 over epsilon. And in particular, uh, for this choice of t, I'm going to end up running in quasi-polynomial in 1 over epsilon time. Okay, so some caveats. Obviously, this, this runtime is quite impractical, um, but I'll say more about this at the end of the talk. Um, there's the extra root log 1 over epsilon factor, and additionally, the sample complexity is prohibitive. So regarding the root log 1 over epsilon factor, uh, we actually conjecture that getting better than this requires at least quasi-polynomial dependence on 1 over epsilon. And we have good reason to believe this uh, because a similar picture sort of arises in the um, setting of robust mean estimation for, for Gaussians. Regarding the sample complexity, uh, as I'll describe later in this talk, um, when we place additional assumptions on the kind of distribution, uh, P, uh, that we're working with, it turns out you can actually get dramatic sample complexity savings. Um, so, so more on this uh, sample complexity later, but for now, let's see how we might try to prove um, theorem one. Okay. So the starting point for this uh, theorem and all theorems in, in this work is the basic observation that you can cast the problem of uh, learning from untrusted batches as a problem of robust mean estimation. Rather than thinking of getting batches, z1 through zk, where each zi is an element uh, in the domain from 1 to n, we can instead regard this batch uh, as a vector of frequencies. We, we can rewrite it as a vector of frequencies, capital X, where the a-th entry of x is simply the empirical uh, frequency of element a among z1 through zk. Right? This vector of frequencies, capital X, uh, for the uncorrupted samples, is simply sampled from the multinomial distribution uh, generated from k draws from p. And in particular, the mean of this normalized multinomial distribution is precisely p. And so the problem of learning p in total variation distance from untrusted batches is precisely the question of uh, robustly estimating the mean of a multinomial distribution in L1 distance. Okay, so how do we go about uh, showing these kinds of results for robust mean estimation? So the general recipe for uh, robust mean estimation is the following. I would like to find a subset of my data which satisfies certain structural properties uh, which the clean subset of points in my data would satisfy. So the uncorrupted points perhaps satisfy some kind of empirical moment bound. I would like the subset that I select to satisfy the same kind of moment bounds. All right, so what do I mean by moment bound? So for the domain size equals 2 case, this is straightforward. 
Um, it's well known that binomial distributions have sub-Gaussian moments up to a certain degree. And this immediately implies that if I take any, any domain size and look at the multinomial distribution, and I project it in any L infinity bounded direction V, then that projection is just going to be a shifted and scaled binomial distribution. And so it's also going to satisfy uh, such sub-Gaussian moments. And so this is our strategy uh, moving forward to find the uncorrupted points. I'm just going to search for a large enough uh, subset of the points which have similarly bounded empirical moments. And in fact, uh, this sort of search question can be phrased in terms of a polynomial system as follows. So the parameters in the system are just going to be uh, the data set itself and some parameter t, which you can think of as a dial that we can turn up in order to increase the complexity of our algorithm and thereby increase, uh, improve the error guarantees. The variables in the system are going to be uh, our estimate for the mean, so some p hat, which lives in the simplex, and indicators for each of the points. In particular, w sub i, I want to take to be equal to 1 if I believe that the ith point uh, in my data set is uncorrupted. So this is going to be the indicator for the, the subset I want to pick out. And so, of course, I want the sum of the WIs to be big. I want it to be roughly the average size of the true uncorrupted points in my, in my data set. Of course, I want the WIs to be Boolean. And by definition, p hat should be the empirical mean of the subset I've picked out using the Ws. Okay, now we arrive at the most interesting constraint in the system, which is this moment bound I mentioned. I want my WIs to select out a subset uh, such that if I, if, I pro if I project that empirical distribution um, in any uh, L infinity bounded direction V, then the resulting projected distribution should have a uh, sub Gaussian moment bounds as follows. Okay, so this is the polynomial system we'll work with. Um, and again, uh, the point is I want to select out a big subset of the points which have the appropriate moment bounds. Okay, so uh, what's the main technical fact you need to show? You need to show that if I have some satisfying assignment to the polynomial system, then it should yield a p hat, which satisfies the desired uh, TV bound. Okay. Turns out showing this, uh, this technical fact uh, requires ingredients very similar to the ones that are needed for a robust mean estimation for, for sub-Gaussians um, in Hopkins-Lee. And already, just from the lemma itself, we know that if I literally could solve this polynomial system, then the resulting p hat would be good. The issue, of course, is that I can't actually solve arbitrary poly polynomial systems uh, uh, in polynomial time. But the additional piece of information I have is that the proof of this lemma uh, is simple in the sense that it's just a sequence of applications of uh, holders. Okay. Um, and the fact that this lemma has such a simple proof, uh, specifically in the sum of squares proof system, is already enough to imply the following. That any pseudo distribution over solutions can be rounded to an estimator p hat, which satisfies the desired TV bound. Okay, I won't go into details about what a pseudo distribution is, but suffice it to say it's some relaxation of the notion of a distribution over solutions to the, to the system. But unlike a distribution over solutions, I can actually find a pseudo distribution over solutions efficiently. And this is the sort of SOS uh, proofs to algorithms paradigm that I, that's uh, by now fairly well studied. I won't go into further details about this. Okay, so that's a very high level overview of how uh, theorem one is proved. Let's move on to the main result of this work. Right, so it's reasonable to ask, is there any way to improve the sort of prohibitively large sample complexity we got from theorem one if we make additional assumptions about the underlying distribution P? Uh, these kinds of structural assumptions could be that the distribution is monotone, log concave, multimodal, monotone hazard rate, and these sorts of assumptions are naturally occurring in areas like economics and reliability theory. In fact, just to convince you that uh, the intersection of the problem of learning from untrusted batches and the problem of learning structure distributions is not empty, let's consider the following applications, slightly different from the crowdsourced uh, learning uh, setting that I was talking about earlier. Let's imagine now that you're some kind of auction designer 
and you would like to estimate the demand curve um, of your bidders. Okay. And the point is that uh, there might be some small but constant fraction of your bidders who are trying to skew the outcome of your auction by giving you spurious bids. And you would like to design a mechanism which is robust to these kinds of uh, corruptions. And of course, in this case, these demand curves satisfy uh, the property that they're monotone. Um, and one could hope that in this kind of low data setting where maybe that you don't have enough uh, bidders to run the algorithm from my previous slides, um, you would still like to sort of be robust to these kinds of corruptions. Okay, so before I talk about robustness, let's just uh, review uh, what's known about learning structured distributions in the classical, just vanilla IID. Um, uh, clean data case. Okay, so let's say um, I just draw IID samples from such a structured distribution. The point is that if I use uh, samples that are um, sublinear in the domain size, I can't hope for the empirical estimator to concentrate well enough in L1. Okay, but what can I do? Well, the, the main sort of uh, idea from this line of work is to use a different norm. Okay, so let's let a sub k be the set of all unions of at most k intervals over n, where k should be thought of as some kind of complexity parameter for my distribution. Okay, so here's just an example of uh, a subset uh, of domain size 20 um, that lies in A3. Okay, so the AK distance is just going to be the norm induced by this family of test vectors. Namely, if I have two distributions P and Q, the AK distance between P and Q is just going to be the max absolute difference between the weight that P assigns to some subset in AK and the mass that Q assigns to that same subset. And note that when capital K is equal to little n, the domain size, then the AK distance is precisely the total variation distance because A sub n is just all subsets of n. And the key fact, uh, this is just the VC inequality, says that if I want to just concentrate an AK norm, then it suffices to take roughly K over epsilon squared samples uh, in order for the empirical estimator to be within AK distance epsilon of the true distribution. So this says something about AK, how can I now get some kind of guarantee in L1? Well, the point is if my distribution P were uh, structured, let's say it was some kind of histogram, so a piecewise constant function, then I can draw enough samples so that the empirical estimator is close in AK distance, and then run a simple dynamic program to compute an approximation of the empirical estimator by uh, a histogram, call it P star. And it turns out by several applications of triangle inequality that P star is just going to be a good approximation to P, uh, not just in AK norm, but in L1 distance. Um, and so a couple years back, uh, work of Acharya, Diakoni Kolas, uh, Lee, and Sun showed that uh, actually you can extend this not just to the piecewise constant uh, setting, uh, but to this uh, piecewise polynomial um, regime. So now imagine P is well approximated by a degree D S piece polynomial. They give a more sophisticated algorithm for step two that allows you to run, uh, to, to round the empirical estimator to the best piecewise polynomial approximation. And this general recipe then allows you to uh, learn structured distributions uh, under this definition uh, in L1 using very few samples. Okay, and we would like to port these kinds of techniques over to the untrusted batches setting. Um, and it turns out all you really have to do is extend our techniques um, to this challenging AK norm. What do I mean by that? Let's return to the original problem statement for untrusted batches. Uh, recall that our goal there was to output an estimator, p hat, which is close in, p, in tb to p. Well, given the sophisticated subroutine of Acharya et al., it suffices now to produce an estimator that's just close in ak norm. And the hope is that we only need roughly uh, poly k over epsilon squared samples to do so. Okay, so if I return to the polynomial system that was central to our algorithm, now, instead of trying to quantify over uh, L infinity bounded vectors, I need to quantify over all L infinity ve bounded vectors with a bounded number of sign changes. Okay, so I didn't say exactly how we were able to encode this exponentially large collection of constraints uh, in the proof of theorem one, but at a high level, the reason is that the set of test vectors then, which was just the entire hypercube, 
is very easy to encode algebraically. The, uh, the constraints are precisely that vi squared is equal to 1 for all i from 1 to n. But now if I pass to this more sophisticated family of test vectors, where I have this extra sign change constraint, it's no longer clear how to uh, encode this uh, challenging combinatorial constraint using algebraic ones. Okay. And uh, sort of the key workaround is to pass to a, another appropriate convex relaxation as follows. Okay, so the key observation is that any uh, bit stream with a bounded number of sign changes is actually sparse on a different basis. So in the so-called Haar wavelet basis, uh, an example for domain size 8 uh, is shown here, um, actually any such vector v is going to be uh, k log n sparse, where k is roughly the number of sign changes. So if I now relax from bounded sign change vectors to just bit strings which have uh, Haar sparse representation, Okay, first of all, this is still not a convex constraint, but now it's straightforward to relax it to some kind of analytic uh, sparsity notion. So uh, I can now look at test vectors which are any real vector with L2 squared norm uh, equal to that of a bit string, uh, but such that its L1 norm in the Haar basis is at most K log n. So here capital H is just uh, the matrix of Haar wavelet basis vectors. Okay, so this is some convex set now that I can work with. Um, and it turns out that once I have this, uh, it's easy to encode efficiently um, this uh, moment bound that's quantified over all such vectors V. Okay, so uh, I'm skipping a lot of technical details, but at a high level, what do we get from this? So recall that our first theorem showed that in the completely unstructured case, we get the following runtime and sample, complex sample complexity guarantees. Now, if we pass to this structured case where, for instance, our distribution P might be a piecewise polynomial or approximated by one, we can replace the sample complexity guarantee of uh, which depended on N with one that depends only on this parameter capital K. In particular, for applications like uh, learning monotone distribution, block concave, et cetera, this K is typically at most logarithmic in the domain size. Okay, um, so now let me just conclude. Um, the first takeaway should be that uh, these moment-based approaches to robust mean estimation in Euclidean norm uh, turn out to be successful uh, in much broader generality. Um, so in this work, we demonstrated uh, its use, uh, this technique's use uh, for L1 norm, and even for this combinatorially challenging AK norm. Along the way, we gave a flexible framework for exploiting prior structural information about uh, the distribution P, um, and surprisingly, we managed to achieve sublinear sample complexity even while running a sum of squares algorithm. Finally, let me mention some concurrent and follow-up work. So independently of the work that I described today, uh, Jane and Orlitsky actually gave an improved result for the unstructured case. Um, so they showed that you can achieve this delta plus epsilon square root log one over epsilon over root k uh, error guarantee um, in actually polynomial time as opposed to quasi-polynomial time. Um, the reason is that they work with uh, a non sum of squares algorithm, specifically an algorithm inspired by the filtering based approach to robust mean estimation for Gaussians. And then in subsequent follow up work, which was again independent, um, we managed to show that you can combine the filtering based approach with this Haar sparsity uh, um, technique in order to get uh, similar guarantees even in the structured case. And the main upshot of all of this is that the algorithms we end up getting are actually implementable. Okay, so uh, lastly, I'll mention that I think there's still plenty of interesting, interesting theory left to be done, both for um, understanding instances where this kind of batch structure can get you improved robustness guarantees. Um, but more generally, I think there's a lot of interesting um, problems in this crowdsource learning and federated learning uh, space that are uh, ripe for um, uh, people in, in theory to attack. Um, so. Yeah, I, uh, I encourage you to ask me uh, any questions about this or other parts of my talk um, in the comment section for this video, um, or if you're attending the conference um, during the synchronous portion of stock. Um, but for now, that's, that's it. Uh, so thanks for listening.